from the exhibit. The exhibit is instructional. On the black curtain, words ripple, an alphabet of light vanishing. Here is the first specimen. Hieroglyphs cover the fabric that shrouds the body from head to foot. The body that has been folded into an impossibility or the smallness of form. There are places we do not trespass. There are places we must let others trespass. All that can be done is to hold breath until the river. The bones become transparent, highlighting the teeth. A static jammed thing you were told late at night. A question you were made to answer. The exhibit says you must. The specimens in their glass boat say, we can wait. In the mirror, you see your child self. With the boy, you build traps for the girl. With the girl, you build traps for the boy. Here is the knotted rope. Here are the hickory slats and splinters of bone. The exhibit says they can only belong to you. Two. The exhibit is pointing in a direction only you can see. There are arrows on every wall and the arrows point to hands. It is suggested you consider including the names that have cut deeper. You don't. Instead, stand before the mirror as the cotton is tucked and the light is revealed. Here is the body, its codes. Here is the flat belly parenthesized in the pelvis. Here are the numbers descending the steps. Some water you ache to drink and the wrong thing to say, always the wrong thing. The exhibit asks you to make a decision. Each direction waits. The moon grows teeth. On this side is the miniature cathedral with the spine below the arch and the molar roof. On this side, the dark room and the eyelet in the door. On still another side is the cat in the silver jar. This is the exhibit's pain. You cannot see every side at once. Three. We had been thinking the exhibit was about love, but it turned out to be something else. When we passed the vine archway, you said you'd been in this room before. The guards were skeptical. Neat rows of lampposts, maps out of their frames and upside down. Each map will lead you to a certain room. You will be surprised by your feelings. You will be surprised by the boundaries. There is a key that locks this door and another that unlocks it. The exhibitors have hidden both in a barrel of sand that children dig through. The sand refills itself. If you come to the exhibit in the morning, you are allowed to touch. If you come at night, you are not. And if you visit the exhibit in your sleep, only it is allowed to touch you. You can sob all night, but you have to wait it out. Four. The exhibit is an astrology lesson. It says the world is made of spheres. They slide back and forth and around and between without knowing prepositions. One sphere holds everything we know. The second sphere holds everything we don't know. Every morning something catches on fire. The third sphere holds the other spheres but is still lonely because the fourth sphere holds love. When she cranes her neck up at the sky at night, she shivers. This may be because she is trying to find Scorpio. She is more afraid of falling up endlessly than gravity. The night is colder than it should be. She wonders if one of the spheres has a hole a leak that hisses the light out like a deflated tire. The fifth sphere holds the sun. Spheres six and seven don't know what love is, but can recite equations. 
We sat under them when you said you were leaving. The cold came in then like a guest that wants to love you all night. The eighth sphere is rounder than the gold ring at the bottom of the drawer in the attic. Even a guest knows this, having never seen the dust halo. The sun is quieter than you would imagine. I am the ninth sphere. Five. The exhibit is a lightning storm. You walk into it thinking you will die or learn something. Behind each curtain is a word that feels wrong on the tongue. On this body, see how the false tongue protrudes. No one knows why. Here is the dry corn silk hair. Here is the nasal walnut half. Underneath the scapula, a curled child. He didn't mean what he said. Underneath her hair, the skull is a generous orange. Words unripen. Another child on the chest, lengthy forms of punishment. Underneath the blue shawl, her hands fold. Underneath those, no one has seen. Here is the release and the temporal hold, signified by clay beads, a comb, braids of fiber. Blackened skin shines underneath the glass, but does not reflect. You assign meaning to texture. At the end of the storm, you fit the words together and they wash out in the rain. Thank you. I am haunted by the dreams. These visions of sidewalks under trees in varied weather. Indiscriminate in their attachment to time and place, they flash and leap about, playful as a lantern dancing lit above the deepest water. As beads strung along twine, they are connected, but as twine breaks and beads scatter, so does the memory. The richness of a full bucket splashed to vanishing upon some now glistening garden's pebbled path emptied only to be filled anew. At this point, the visions shatter, and I am returned to an empty railroad yard in the middle of nowhere with a drink in my hand, and there's a star outside, and it is nighttime, and I've been doing something terrible lately, involving this nice woman I don't really care for, but seem to let spend time with me nonetheless. I've been down this road before, this path of letting people into my house just to watch them scream and fiddle as it is burned to the ground. The look of ashes on the cheeks is so becoming and makes me happy inside, which is nice because lately it has been so difficult to smile. All the birds I see are black and larger than I'd like, or they are massed and swooping, like the wall of grackles that descends when dusk falls in West Texas. It was only the year before I was in Tohoka, working labor, lifting things, or at least I had the aim of doing this, but things kind of worked out for the worse, seeing as how I couldn't actually keep a job, but from all the drinking, I just couldn't seem to help myself from doing. So after pretty much everyone had thrown me out of town, and by that I mean I couldn't go nowhere that would serve me a drink, I found myself a ride with a long hauler by the name of Pierogi. No relation, he told me, to the Polish dumpling of similar name with slightly different spelling. Pierogi was a real fishy-smelling beer-bellied bastard, and he gave me the once-over as I stood on the side of Highway 380, covered in sunburn and the grit of poor hygiene, offering me a ride on the condition that I would but clean my damn broke as a fuck dummy self. So I took the first shower I'd had in months, and I started to think about quitting with this whole drinking thing when I remembered I maybe had a bit more in a little Welch's grape juice plastic bottle that I'd been forgetting about for weeks. So I up and checked my pack and found the bottle, and sure enough, it smelled strong when I whiffed it, so I made my way back to the road and nursed that grape juice like it was my own mother's sweet burning milk, and I, her, as yet unbroken, only begotten a son, until Pierogi rumbled up to where I was standing and honked his horn for me to hop on and ride with him all the way to San Diego. At least that was the plan, but Pierogi was one weird piece of work, the likes of which I couldn't really make heads or tail of. 
Maybe it was the grape working itself purple on my brain, but I'm pretty sure Pierogi told me in more ways than one that he normally mutilated and killed the people he picked up and let hitch a ride. But that with me, I was such a sorry-looking fool, and the drink had obviously left my brain peppered with as many holes as a forgotten backcountry dirt road, that I just wouldn't be worth it. For what's the fun in sticking a knife in some damn fool who just about might laugh when you do it, and laugh harder still when he up and sees the blood coming out his own damn self? Now maybe you'll be calling me crazy with me telling you this, or maybe it's just proving Pierogi's point that I was nothing but a damn silly fool. But when he finished telling me all this, and I'd had a chance to have a nap on it, I realized I was a mite bit hurt by the whole rejection aspect of it all. I wasn't even good enough to mutilate and torture, okay, I get that, but the guy didn't even want to kill me. And the more I drove with him, the more I was shocked that he didn't. I mean, this guy was all about killing. It was all he talked about. And he talked about it non-stop. He showed me Polaroids of so many dismemberings and disembowelings and cutthroats and chop toes that <clears throat> I simply couldn't take it much more, and so I up and lost all my welches all over Pierogi's sweaty beerfish body. I didn't think it too bad, seeing as how it wasn't much but a little bit of old purple swellness. But Pierogi just went dark as a liver and growled and slammed and pulled on those big rigged brakes like a bitch bastard demon and jerked the whole deal to a bone rumbling halt and told me to get the hell out of his truck fast as the winds of fury. Needless to tell you, I did, which is how I lost all my things, seeing as how they were all piled in my packs, which I left behind the seat when I hightailed it out. Just a screaming and a howling straight into the middle of the New Mexico high desert, just outside Albuquerque near the Chamiso wilderness. As close to the kind of fit you don't ever come out of as I ever been. Just so worked up to thinking of sitting for even one minute with something as black and full of all the evil a good man could ever fear to find, as I had on that ride with the man I knew as Barobi. I spent the night in some thorny bush, all full of sorrow for the world. And I cried about the state of things, the wars in far-off places, the children who go hungry. But most of all, I was so full of sorrow about my own self. I didn't have a drink to call my own, no friends, no home, just me, all alone, in some desert with only the stupid stars shouting things at me about what I was to do and who I was supposed to be. I fell asleep in bits, always waking to the image of some blood-spattered Polaroid of some gore-fest that twisted and came alive inside my head, and Pierogi was there, a giant tuna with a sideways glass eye, just watching me unblinking as the pink of his fish gills flapped and flipped and dripped clumps of air matted with urine and beer sweat. It was certainly one of the worst nights I had ever had, and I couldn't help but think, even though I knew it was the kind of think most termed to be bad, that if I had just one little drink with me to keep me company, then maybe the dreams wouldn't be too bad. Maybe I'd be okay with shutting my eyes, but no. I had no drink, so it only goes to figure that I had no sleep, which can only lead one to know that I watched the sunrise over the hills and shoo the darkness away. Sunrise in the desert when you're all alone and you don't have a thing to call your own sure does take its own damn time. Just inching out with these little increments of color sent to spread in slow time across the sand and rocks and bush and cacti. I was hungry and thirsty and so damn cold and I can't say how well I was really knowing if I was still alive or not. So I just started crying these silent great tears that helped blink away the sand that kept blowing all on my face. Then in a burst of suddenness, and there comes out of the morning light this sound from over near the dawn like soft, gentle thunder. Soon a little cloud of dust starts puffing along the earth towards me, still far off, still sort of blocked out by the low morning glare, and it gets closer and turns into a shape of color, which then becomes a horse, and then a horse with someone small on its back. I stand and begin to wave, and the cloud of dust comes to where I am beside the brittle thorny bushes. And there it was. The most beautiful Palomino I'd seen, which some might say isn't saying much since I haven't been around as many horses as maybe some people, but I've seen my share. So I feel sure in saying it a damn sight to see that morning, with velvet shanks gleaming under a layer of fresh exertion, its eyes brown and deep, the pink of its nostrils flaring in and out with every breath. The rider I saw was a small, unassuming figure in poor worksman's clothes, just some old worn jeans and a light blue t-shirt with thick rings of dark and very old perspiration, riding bareback and barefoot, looking to be a bit older than me, but not by much. He looked down at me, and I squinted in the light, and I tried to see if he had kind eyes, or if it was another one of those devils with murder in his mind that I was so quick to be on the lookout for now. I couldn't quite tell, but he did smile and hold a brown and calloused hand down for me and pulled me up with him onto the horse, and I held on as tight as I ever held on to anything. And I marveled at the quiet strength I could feel powering the small, determined man whose skin was the color of rocks at sunset and who hollered like a desert coyote when goat in the fleet horse to flying above the earth of sand and dust and brittle, breakable things onward towards the sky and the clouds and the tops of the mountains. It was only when we landed again in what was, according to him, somewhere in Arizona, 
that I thought to ask the man his name, and whether or not he might be kind enough to lend a silly damn fool a little bit of something to drink, as I was feeling very, very thirsty. Leak. There's a leak inside my head from which the words are pouring on a regular basis. The solidity of others is eluding me. I am renewed whenever I take my clothes off. In closing, I just want to say the words appear inside my skull like phrases floating up inside the darkness of an eight ball made of nothingness. And everyone is an insider in that respect. The future may be blind, but there is a perpetual motion of an inner monologue to make a person feel at home. It's probably related to the habit of whistling in a graveyard, as the earth is an enormous cemetery orbiting in outer space. If you keep talking, then you won't feel out of place. Reminds me of the night when we were reading poems and the riot squad was breathing down our necks because we're in the middle of the street and we were told as long as we kept talking it would constitute a lawful assembly and they wouldn't arrest us. They would test us with a mute intimidation and what else is new. saw moonlight reflect crow's feet and gambling debt like a funhouse mirror. A trip to the pawn shop but he'd get it back. Eventually, next week, next race, someday, and mail it with his apologies to Lubbock. He was no thief, just down on his luck, and surely once in his life, Buddy Holly had to borrow something not his for a quick buck. Plus $36 times three seats on the plane, divided by six races and an alimony check, didn't bring the light any closer to the surface of the holy dug. He bought the plane when American Pie ran as quickly as his wife had run out on him when she heard about the barmaid in Cleveland and the loan shark in Toledo. First race he'd won since he stopped betting on horses and moved on to greyhounds. Felt some kind of kinship with a half-starved animal since the only things in his stomach these days were whiskey and bad dreams. Never took any tests. Felt he would be a natural at flying, joked at the bar he never wanted to be a part of anything that would have him as a member, FAA, AA, or the human race included. He picked up the men at the club, seeing gold mines and guitar cases, and felt like this time things had really turned around. Maybe he could be their private pilot, fly them around the world, heard that Amsterdam had the best hash and the blondest ladies to steer the plane from his lap. In the fray of slurring thoughts, he never phoned a flight plan, seeing as he didn't have a license and the whole damn thing would only take an hour anyway. Fancied himself a renegade, the Charles Lindbergh of drunks, and he reread the manual on one-engine jets as the three men settled their suitcases. They were in the air for five minutes, tinnitus and excitement buzzing away sleep before the wings of the plane frosted like Gabriel in a hell, freezing over and the earth stood still, while the dial spun like 45s and the radio crackled no signal from the tower, like the noisy seconds before a record turns over. The pilot assessed the situation, knew from the manual he had 20 seconds after a nose dive before his air heart ceased to beat, Pulled up on the shifter, radio to Mayday, to air traffic control, to God, to no one, and found gunmetal was warm like the taste of pennies, and unfair like the coin toss that had brought them there. His brains landed with butterfly wings on some cloud next to a bookie calling himself St. Peter. Buddy Holly held his head between his knees, prayed the Lord to keep his glasses, the nightmare of the nearsighted, hailing Mary and cursing the bastard Waylon Jennings in one stolen breath, all the while Richie Valen's ears popped, filling with blood and then silence while the tin box sang like crickets, shook them like popcorn over a sleeping Iowa. 
20 seconds and the glass broke in black frames, a million diamonds shattering from a television screen, an explosion in his eyes of pictures and music, all dance halls and girl screams, the turbulence a million years in a second, and a flash bright as an Amarillo sunset before the big bopper said, but baby, it's over. And somewhere, someone shakes a transistor radio, wondering what happened to the music. Wow. General notice of new opportunity for consciousness artists. In late September 2009, a team led by Professor Shaqib Chowdhury, the Howard Hughes investigator and professor of neurobiology at the University of Berkeley, California's Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, discovered via functional magnetic resonance imaging that unique receptors within the human brain are activated by a specific repetitive form of human language. This language might be described colloquially as small talk, the sort of dialogue that is the daily glue of human existence. Despite extensive testing, no other form of human language has been found to activate the aforementioned portions of the brain, leading to speculation that these receptors are an atavistic remnant of prelingual evolution, perhaps offering the first hard evidence of Rupert Sheldrake's morphic field. Through the auspices of several peer-reviewed studies, it has been determined that the incidental scenes of celebrity sex tapes, the moments in which there, there are no quasi-reproductive activity, but rather in which the participants communicate verbally between their tristan, are the purest distillation of this form of language. A program funded by generous grant of the Ford Foundation has been instituted to read the following text at a series of points throughout the contiguous 48 states. Each point has been chosen for its relative position in a vast, plotted mandala. The hope is that when this text has been read at each designated location, the mandala will activate a resonance within the morphic field it has been speculated that such activity may, perhaps, open the tenth ether of John Dee and Edward Kelly, instituting a state of Corazon on planet Earth. No record of these readings will be made public. Parties interested in participation may contact the Ford Foundation at 320 East 43rd Street, New York, New York, 10017. The text. Transcript of dialogue from a video in which Paris Hilton uses a computer topless while preparing to smoke marijuana from a dragon-shaped pipe with Tommy Hilfiger model Jason Shaw. Jason Shaw, I want to see if our camera works. Nice body, sexy. Paris, get away from me. Jason, sexy. Jason, give me, give me just a little, give me. Give me just, give me a little tit action, okay? Give me a little tit action. Come on, come on. Paris, wanna smoke a little bit? AK-47, it's not that strong. Jason, out of our dragon, you're so beautiful. Mmm, mmm. Paris, out of the dragon? Jason, out of the dragon. Bellissimo, okay, Bella. Paris, but then I can't bring it on the plane anywhere. Jason. Why? We'll clean it. Paris. There is weed enough? Yeah, whatever. Uh-oh. Found it. Jason. What's that? Paris. Dutch farm. Jason. Jadid. Paris. Mm-hmm. Let me look how nasty- let me see how nasty I look. Ew. I'm erasing all of that. Jason. You look so hot. She looks so hot. Paris. Ah. Oh. Jason. I just squeezed her nipple. It was very exciting. Paris. I don't want to be filmed. I look nasty. Jason. Mmm. I love her. I love her. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, boy. Paris. Stop. Jason. Yeah, boy. I love that. Look at that. Look at that dragon. Look at the dragon. Look at that nipple. 
Oh shit, it's all fucking dark. You can't make it up. Paris. Good. Jason, give me some light for the nipple. Give me some light for the nipple. That's bullshit. I bet you can I bet you we can see it. Paris. I have all this like fucking cucumber shit on my face. It looks gross. WW dot Dutch. Stop. I don't like that. Jason, that's all you have to say to me. Baby don't like it. End transcript. This is called Beside Her. It's not that I need my boyfriend back, but this woman living in his body now is hairless and slippery, so I can't get a grip on her. But still, she wants me to fuck her into oblivion, sweet and rough, the way I only fuck my pain, with savage grace, the way I only fuck my ever-expanding sense of culpability. My aunt says, he's going to cut off his penis. I calmly correct her, they're going to invert it. The penis will become the new vaginal canal. I feel superior because I can intellectualize it. But I know what she's getting at. My lover asks me to imagine her penis is a large clitoris and her balls are dangling labia. We don't make it that far into the fantasy. I get scared. I pull away. I begin to wonder if coming out to my family was such a good idea. For over a year, I've snipped the S's off the pronouns, saving the scraps to embroider a gossamer curtain to veil she and I from their scrutiny. Now they are the ones pasting smiles onto faces, revising fictions with fictions, telling me my choices are my own, that their love is unconditional amongst themselves. They speak obsessively about protecting the children. There are no children in sight. I've come to pity that poor, shriveled, unwanted penis because it is slated for execution. My lover says I am doing much better now. I hardly twitch or startle, I barely flinch, flinch or cry. Better, worse, better, worse. I want no more one-word diagnoses. I want her to look under my skin and read the network of veins. I want her to pull open the top of my head like a software engineer unscrews a computer casing. Watch my neurons firing, map the route, learn the way, come and find me. Each night I crawl into bed beside her. I watch her sleep, this woman who resembles the man I said I would marry. For the second time and the first, I am trying to choose her. I imagine her thunderous snores escaping from the atmosphere, being intercepted, decoded by an alien race who are awestruck by the eloquence. They are traveling here now to bring us a cure for pollution and an infinite energy source. Her large breasts rise and fall to the rhythm of her steady breathing without comment or apology. This is called Understanding. We talk in planets, atmospheres, transient amulets, often lost in thinnest air. Transient ambience, intentions losing air, a soup of stars, lighted last words listing, missed conversations cast out, crossing breaths toward atmosphere, slipping stars of sand, through words of hair. Sendero. Nina, wake up. Miguel was shaking her awake in the middle of the night. It was two months after the soldiers killed Poppy. Miguel was squatting on the floor of the hut. In the moonlight, she could see his camouflage fatigue pants and tattered Inca-Cola t-shirt. He had discarded his beloved Peru football jersey shortly after Poppy's death, about the time he started meeting with the man the village didn't talk about, high up on the terraces. 
The man gave Miguel a little red book that took the smile from his youthful face and made him say things like, Soccer is a capitalist diversion, you know, and we must cut the head off the sink. Mama was asleep in the other room in the trance that had taken her since the soldiers had killed Poppy. An alpaca skin and entrails were drying on a wooden rack by the dead fire. Cooking pots and firewood were stacked neatly by the wall. Miguel, Nina whispered, what is it? But she already knew. Outside the hut in the shadows, shining path cadres waited silently for her brother. Nina had been dreading this day ever since the cinches had stripped Miguel naked and beaten him in front of her and Mama a few days after they took Malki away. They wanted a confession that Poppy had been a terrorist, but Miguel had not uttered a word. If Nina had once feared that Miguel would run off to Cusco to chase money and girls, the new Miguel only made her wish he had. She looked at the stranger squatting beside her bed in the moonlight. A faint glow seemed to emanate from his eyes. The senderistas have come for you, Miguel, she said. Yes, Nina, he said quietly. It's my turn. Did you take the oath? Yes. So her brother was no longer a brother, but a senderista, a member of the Shining Path. One who had agreed to his own death once he killed his quota of soldiers and capitalists. Death could come by suicide attack, in battle, it didn't matter. She started to cry. Nina, he whispered gruffly in a voice that seemed to struggle with the old, playful Miguel. Uncle Oscar will send for the two of you. But in truth, you know it is you who must look after Mom. But Miguel, what about you? I don't walk this path alone. Nina gulped back salty tears. Tell Mama I ran away to Cusco, Miguel said. Mama knows you would never run away and leave us. In her heart, Nina wanted to believe it. When Uncle Oscar sends for the two of you, you must convince Mama to leave. This village will not be safe. There's going to be a great reckoning. One of the men outside the hut leaned in. Comrade Samson, he said quietly, it's time to leave this life behind. They had already assigned him his new name. Miguel Nina said, does it do any good for me to plead? Miguel put his rough fingers over her lips. It's done. After that, Mama and Nina moved, not to Lima, as Uncle Oscar urged, but higher into the Andes, away from the Red Zone, back to the Puna, where Mama came from. Lima was a sewer for the Spaniards, Mama said. Nina had just turned 13. Shining Path guerrillas were killing more soldiers, and she wondered how many Miguel had killed. Whenever she learned of a soldier being killed inside, she was secretly pleased. She knew that was wrong because the guerrillas did many wicked things as well. But she couldn't help wondering if Miguel had found the soldier who shot Poppy and sliced the bottoms of his feet open before forcing him to take the walk of death. Nina had seen bodies floating down the river. One day she saw a soldier bloated in black, and she thought, did my brother kill him? How bitter she felt at times. Eventually it became an overall feeling of what was happening to her people. Before they left Juanin, the soldiers came and a sergeant questioned Nina. Had the Tarukos been here? No. Was she sure? Yes. Where was her papa? She didn't know the soldiers would not let them have his body. He was probably in the country somewhere, wherever the soldiers still think. The sergeant said she was very old. Where was her brother? He ran away to Cusco. Your brother is a coward, the sergeant said, and touched Nina's hair. I'm 13, she said, and moved away. And if my brother were here now, you would not do that. He nodded and asked Nina to comb her hair for a moment. She said no. He asked again, saying he didn't want to hurt her, only to watch her brush her hair. So she brushed her long black hair while he watched, and she thought, Miguel will kill you too. It was easier to manage. I started kindergarten that fall, we went off to Guyana. Granny cut off my dreadlocks. She knew how to press and curl, ponytail and cornrow, but palm roll locks till the roots stiffen with beeswax, glistens like licorice, she didn't know. For that matter, no one in the projects knew what to do with hair left natural, left unparted and wild. They were afraid to touch the unmothered parts of themselves. 
Each snit made each one alive and each one dead. And if you said goodbye, it was an honest whisper, short and fine in your throat. She cut my hair like a boy who hadn't been to the barber for a month. And I sat at the cafeteria table alone for weeks. They couldn't make sense of me, my classmates, with their gender proper hairstyles. I didn't want anything to do with franks and beans, those pucks of grilled meat. I waited at lunchtime for peanut butter and jelly and was hesitant to eat bread that wasn't the color of you and me. It was hard not hearing your voice each morning throughout the day and unwilling to correct them when they said my name wrong, I gave into the sizzling. The fried chicken crunched between my teeth. I could have bitten both of your hands for leaving me here. Each finger for the gunshots that rang the night. The footsteps running on the roof. The gravel mashed deeper and deeper into my sleep. Flocks of butterflies broke my skin and I was shattered where I stood. A whole constellation of wondering if I could throw myself to the sky, coated with urgent whispers, you see that I missed you, that the barter was unfair, that you mistook me for sheep. Thank you.